Mr. Mr. Kirchhoff can can start his presentation. You ready, Don? I'm ready. Alrighty. All right. So go ahead and and do your thing. Okay, I assume everybody can see this first slide and, and you can hear me. Um, first thing I'd like to do is thank Julia Bird for all the work she's doing in our San Antonio chapter to set up these meetings and, and get us on, um, on these uh, electronic devices that we can communicate with in spite of the pandemic. And I'm hoping that most everybody got to look at the video of our property that was prepared by the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. It gives a little bit of background of our family and why and how we got into this. So I'm gonna skip all of that and just get directly into um, the process that we went through. Now, let's see, I need to, there we go. Okay, I got that off my screen. Okay, the, I wanna go through the process that we've been involved with for the last about 10 years and then, and then share with you some of the results. We started out, of course, uh, in doing it this by ourselves and pretty much failed. And I don't wanna go through those failures, although uh, failing provides some real good experiences sometimes. We learn a lot. So let's start with the point where we began doing things right. And that was to get professional advice on how to restore a prairie. We had attempted on 10 acres initially that didn't work for two years. And the first advice we got was to start small. Uh, start on a small scale, be successful on a small scale, and then expand it to something larger. Uh, the person who gave us that advice was Chris Best. He's a state botanist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. What he advised us to do is just go around the, uh, the, the county roads, find some old, old cemeteries, abandoned railroad tracks, um, old bridges, river crossings, and the like, and look for remnant stands of native plants. Collect the seeds, grow them at home in some trays, and then transplant the seedlings to a, a plot on the farm, and make sure we know how to, how to make that work. And once that's successful, go, go full scale, um, which we then did. And the full scale operation, we discovered pretty quickly required three phases. One was preparation, and that no doubt was the most important because we have to remember that the, the land we're working with, whether it's a, uh, a couple of uh, pots in our back patio or a portion of our backyard or, or many acres at a time, all of these environments have been impacted by humans for uh, one or two centuries. So the conditions that existed for native plants to reseed themselves and grow don't exist today. And preparation gets us at least in that direction so that the native plants can succeed. And then the second phase of the restoration was the planting events. And then following that is the maintenance that will have to go on basically for decades. And then after we got a lot of plants growing in the prairie, we didn't want just plants. We wanted to cause wildlife to recover very rapidly as well. So sort of in a nutshell, uh, that is what we did. And what I'm gonna describe about doing things, especially on a small scale, anybody can do that. Uh, whether you're, you're working uh, with some planters on your back patio or your, or your or backyard or a lot of acres. Now, our starting point was this. From 30,000 foot level, what we really had was a postage stamp floating in an ocean of farmland and ranch land. And that postage stamp in our case was 200 acres. I hope you can see my pointer here, but that 200 acres included about 30 acres of what we called pasture. And as we got into this process, the, the naturalists who came out there, they didn't call that pasture, they called it riparian forest. Well, we didn't know we had forest, but now we do. So we have 30 acres of forest and then 170 acres of row crop land that had been in row cropping for at least a century. So that being our starting point, we took the steps that Chris suggested. We went around the, 
the county roads and and um, abandoned railroad tracks and so forth, uh, uh, trying to collect seeds. Now understand, we knew what a plant was, but we didn't know what that plant was that we were looking at while we were doing this. So we took photographs of plants or, or cut specimens and sent them to Chris, and he told us what we were finding. Uh, you know, he, he would tell us, well, that's an invasive plant. You don't want that on your property. And this one over here is uh, definitely native and, and you want it. So we would mark these plants, we would collect the seeds, and then we would plant them in trays like you see here. And we would grow these um, at our homes. And when the, the plants were grown a little bit, we took them to the farm into what became what we later called our seed increase plot. This was the old cow pen, and uh, we prepared it for these native plants. Uh, initially, what we did is we, we tilled the soil repeatedly over a period of about a year. Every time it would rain, thousands of weeds and other plants would come up. We would, we would disc it again to kill them. Uh, next time it rained, more seed would sprout. And the whole idea there was to deplete the seed bank of unwanted plants. And once we had done that, then we went in, I, I hope you can see my cursor here down on the very bottom of this frame. We put in drip lines. And then on top of the drip lines, we put uh, a weed barrier. And then we poked holes through that weed barrier. And you can see four plants right here. We planted all of these seedlings through this weed barrier and had a very, very controlled environment. So these seedlings didn't have the oppressive uh, competition that it, that they would have had if we tried, and when we did try planting the seed in these unprepared soil. And doing that, after two years of failure, we became very successful. Those That method of planting uh, protected the natives. And we had two areas in this plot, which was hardly an acre, uh, may have been that big, probably more like half an acre. Uh, half of it we were growing grasses in, and this uh, this side here we were we were growing uh, forbs in, or or native wildflowers. And uh, being successful means that those plants went into seed, and we began producing seed. And we bought some books on on how to sort these seeds, clean them, remove the chaff, and we made three screens: a a, uh, a fine screen here. Um, this is a, was a medium screen, and then we had a core screen. And, and we began producing uh, some limited quantities of a variety of, of native plants that were simply not even available commercially. So that was successful. We, we felt good about it, and that's when we became very dangerous. We figured we could take that step now into full-scale restoration and go through those uh, the three processes of preparation, planting, and maintenance. So let's walk through those three steps, at least the way we implemented them. You saw the picture of the 200-acre postage stamp that we were dealing with. We basically had three kinds of field. We had about 15 acres of coast, coastal Bermuda, very difficult to kill, uh, about 20 acres of pasture grass field, where our parents had uh, grown grazers, different kind of uh, plants that cattle grazed and made hay on. And then all the balance of the field, well over 100 acres, was row cropped. To, to prepare the coastal Bermuda field, uh, our parents had sold all the cattle years earlier, so we, we allowed the neighbor to bring his cattle onto this coastal Bermuda from early growing season, like starting into February or early March, and just grazed the heck out of it. We wanted to really weaken that coastal Bermuda. And then when the hot summer arrived, we, we had to spray that field three times with glyphosate, uh, which is really a, a roundup. And um, after three applications, we still hadn't killed all of it. And a fourth application was, was acquired, required in one corner. But by that point, we, we pretty much had a sterilized field where we could plant. The pasture grass field provided a totally different challenge. It had been, uh, it had grazers in it for many years, 
So the seed bank of undesirable plants was extremely high. There was no possible way that, um, that native plants could compete with all of that. And we were advised just to take those acre, that acreage and just give it to the renter who was renting the hundred and something other acres and let him farm it for three years. And, and what he, he was using modern farming techniques, which involved planting uh, Roundup Ready corn, this is ger uh, uh, genetically modified corn and maize. And then he would, he would spray these fields several times a year with Roundup and kill everything, which really left a monoculture, but that's what was desirable in order that when we planted this field, there was not so much competition and the native plants could survive. Now the row crop fields actually turned out to be the easiest to restore to a prairie because they had already been uh, planted with Roundup Ready crops and, and treated with Roundup for years, thereby leaving all these acres very a very low um, seed bank of undesirable seeds. So that was basically the preparation that was involved in each of these fields. The goal for every field being this, we wanted a sterile field with not only nothing growing there, but very few invasive seeds in the top inch of this soil. So <clears throat> in the last year that the renter made a crop, we didn't disturb the soil at all we went in and planted directly onto his, into his stubble uh, in, an, in an undisturbed field. So now we're in the, in the planting phase, and this is the expensive phase. These seeds are not cheap, and uh, we needed financial support to do that. So we applied for a Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, WIP grant, W-H-I-P, that's wildlife, Habitat Improvement Program grant. And along, and with that came money, about half the cost to do all of this work. We, the, the four of us siblings, uh, footed the other half. And, uh, and along with that came a lot of good advice, things that we didn't know about how to restore a prairie. Uh, NRCS recommended the seed mix. It was really a long list of, of seed that worked in our part of Wilson County. And we took that list to Douglas King Seed in San Antonio. Uh, at that time, now this was like eight or nine years ago, they had only, I think, 15 of these plants available. So the seed mix that we bought was 50, had about 15 uh, varieties in it. And I remember from uh, Robert and Melissa Creech's presentation at our, at our Zoom meeting last month, when they did the same thing more recently, I believe they had about 40 species in it. So this tells you how uh, seed development of these native plants on a commercial basis is, is growing and you get a lot more uh, varieties these days. Not, not only do you have to have the right seed, but you have to have the right equipment to plant these seeds. One of the things that we didn't know at the beginning, but we learned this is that, and it makes common sense, the native seeds simply fell on the ground. They didn't have the benefit of modern agricultural techniques. For thousands of generations, they just fell on the ground and were trampled into the soil, perhaps by herds of buffalo or other animals. The seeds loved that tight soil seed contact. That's what enabled them to germinate. And that's what the special equipment called a no-till drill does. It, it, it sort of mimics how um, native plants were planted by nature for thousands of generations. So then over a, a three-year period in four planting events, we planted all 170 acres. In, there were two planting events in early May and two planting events in early September. And the conditions changed from planting event to planting event. Sometimes it was dry, sometimes it was wet, sometimes it didn't rain after we planted, other times it did rain. And it's been really interesting to see the outcome. Every one of these events, uh, driven by pretty much by weather conditions, uh, had different outcomes. 
Here you see one of our planting events. Uh, the uh, tractor in the background is ours. This is Douglas King's no-till drill. This is our brother Scott. After he's made some passes here with the planter, he's in there checking to see um, what, uh, see if in fact the, the drill is dropping the seed. And what you see here is we planted right on top of the, uh, the, the renter's last harvest without disturbing the soil in any way. This is an interesting picture in that it shows Scott checking the seed. And what do you see his finger kicking up is dust. So here is a planting event in early September after the August harvest, the hot summer sun, dry soil. So we were planting into dry dirt. This, in, in this particular event, we were very lucky. Within one week after this planting, we began to get heavy rains in September and uh, had a wet fall. And the, the outcome of plenty of rain after a planting event produced switchgrass, which in its second year was nine feet tall. And what you don't see at the, very well at the bottom of this picture is throughout this area, as all of these small grasses, a large variety of small grasses with this tall clump switchgrass growing in between. So this was a very successful uh, planting event because the weather conditions were so cooperative. And uh, to, to sort of make some more comments about the planting event, the, the first planting event we had was in May. I forgot what year it was, but it was in the middle of a severe drought. It didn't rain for a while and we did have a, sh when we did finally get a shower, uh, a bunch of small grasses came up. You could see them. We could see for sure that it was the grass that we planted because they were all in these little rows. But the grass has only got about six or seven inches tall, turned brown and died, or at least we thought they died. And they sat that way for two or three months before the next shower came along. And those dead plants greened out. This was something we learned about these native grasses and some of them some of their resilience, those small grasses can really tolerate a lot of dry weather. But what did not happen in a planting event followed by a lot of drought is the tall grasses did not survive. So in those events, we have a prairie with a big variety of small grasses, but very little uh, of the tall grasses like switchgrass, uh, four flower trichloris, um, and, and some of the other tall grasses, but we have a lot of the small grasses. And as you watch over time, the, 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 the taller grasses are moving into these fields that originally only had very sharp grasses. Oops. Then, then following the, uh, the, the planting is, the, for, uh, is maintenance. And I'm sure this will have to go on for decades but there are some surprises in the maintenance, at least for us. The biggest surprise to us was the huge amount of work needed to control the invasive species that come up. Uh, Texas is plagued with introduced grasses everywhere. Uh, the KR blue stem, King Ranch blue stems, Silky blue stem, Medio blue stem, and collectively there will referred to these days as old world blue stems, and they're everywhere. Uh, and, and so, the, so there's the grasses that are invasive, and then in, in our part of Wilson County, there are three uh, woody plants that are invasive, bacris, weasatch, and mesquite. All of these happen to be somewhat native, but they become invasive and they choke out uh, the initial efforts to get a prairie started. So we're gonna talk about all of these. Other management tools we are using is prescribed grazing. That's using herds of cattle to mimic, mimic herds of buffalo. We're producing hay. We hope to use fire on a large scale, but at this point, we're involved only with uh, control burn tests, and we're doing some shredding. And Scott, our brother, came up with this idea to use a stalk cutter, which he calls ours, our steel buffalo. It's, it's basically a machine that rolls and it chops uh, the plants so that in, like in February, when, when what remains standing are the dead, tough stalks of the tall grasses, 
we can run this stall cutter over it like a herd of buffalo and it it chops that stuff up it makes it it appears to make it look easier for the clump and other grasses to green out. Now we've experimented with this only one time. It looks like we've got good results and we'll, we'll certainly be doing some more of that. So these are the maintenance tools that we're using uh, with this prairie. This, this slide here shows you what uh, a newly planted prairie in its second year look like. Uh, we have good, good cover, a good variety of grasses, if you can see my cursor moving here through the middle of this frame, there's a lot of short grasses here. And over here to the side and, and where I'm moving right now, these are middle, gra middle height grasses, uh, mostly like a four flower trichloris or Rhodes trichloris, they call it. And over here on the left side is switchgrass and way in the back, you see a lot of switchgrass. But what you see in the middle here is just a whole bunch of stuff we don't want. Uh, this particular area is invaded with Bacchus. Bacchus is native, it's a beautiful plant. One of them here and there in the prairie really looks good. Uh, butterflies love it. But if when this gets as thick like this, in one year, these plants will be eight or nine or 10 feet tall and completely choking out the prairie. So we learned that we have to control these in the first year. And we did several things with the advice, particularly of Texas Parks and Wildlife Services, uh, our department, and that was uh, shred these, get them down short, and then when they green out like these, uh, hit them with 2,4-D, they're very susceptible to that chemical, and, it, and it, it kills them very effectively. So we've used just about every possible tool available, and I'll show you some more, to rid ourselves of these invasive uh, woody plants. We are uh, deeply indebted to the volunteers that have come out to our prairie over the last several years, uh, particularly from groups like the San Antonio chapter of NPAT and Alamo area master naturalists and, and other landowners in the area who are interested in doing the same thing. So here you see a couple of volunteers using a lopper. These are Wesatch, young Wesatch seedlings growing. So they cut these off at the ground, treat that small stump with a little bit of diesel and remedy, that kills it. We then stack this wood, we've got some pretty big stacks of wood out here in this prairie, which become great habitat for birds. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be surprised at all the birds that zip into these piles of wood uh, when you walk in, across the prairie. When the bushes get a little bit too big, like this we satch tree here, we use power equipment, like this brush cutter, or pole saws and uh, cut the brush down at ground level, um, treat that stump and then stack this bush uh, on, a, on a wood pile somewhere. And when the trees really get out of control like they did in the summer of 2019, just a year and a half ago, we had to hire a contractor to come out there with this machine and he could reach down in the ground and pull these big we side trees. Some of them had gotten up to about nine or 10 feet tall he could pull them out of the ground and stack them. But this was very expensive. So we had a big, big expense that year just to control the, uh, this one plant, Wesatch, invading the, the prairie. Now the grass, controlling the invasive grasses, I don't think we, anybody has a handle on that. We surely don't. Here's an area where the, the prairie is looking really good. And using this as an example, I'll describe what we see where the invading grasses have come in. All of these short grasses right here, I should say, or at least most of them are native, but we have some areas where this is basically KR blue stem or invasive grasses. And, and what we have noticed is standing in these invasive grasses are the big robust clump grasses like switchgrass. And this mother plant here will drop its seed and it may, in the second generation, have two, three, it may have 30 little switchgrass plants around them. And then what we see these colonies of switchgrass growing uh, and standing in these pockets of invasive grasses. And so we think over a period of time, um, these native grasses are going to, we hope, outcompete some of the invasives. If they don't, we'll have to go to some other other plan. 
Another management we tool is we use is the is uh, buffalo. This is called prescribed grazing. Um, we call these buffalo. Some people call these cattle. And uh, what we have done with the prairie is put in some cross fencing, electric fencing. We had a grip grant grassland restoration incentive program grant that helped us buy electric fencing. So the, the, the property is, is uh, sectioned like a pie. The central part of it is where the cattle can come to get a drink. And then we can let them out into whichever section of pie we are, uh, we want a, a, a buffalo herd out there grazing. One of the reasons North America lost its tall grass prairie, of which there were 25 million square miles when in the early 1800s, and today there's less than 1% of that remaining. One of the reasons is, is the cattle of the cattle drives, followed by cattle on ranches. Cattle love some of these tall grasses. They're sweet, and the cattle ate their favorite grass to extinction, and then they began eating the second favorite grass, the third favorite grass until there's very few of these natives left. So in prescribed grazing, what we do is we make the cows stay on a relatively small area until they've eaten everything. And then we either take them off the property or we move them to the next field if it is scheduled for prescribed grazing that year. We're also making hay. Uh, hay does two things. One, it takes the excess forage off of the prairie uh, since we're not yet using fire, the, this forage really builds up sometimes. It can begin choking out the, the prairie grass itself. For, and the hay is a source of revenue that helps us uh, pay the bills for the prairie. Here our brother Scott is checking out the hay. We've had this nutrition tested and it tests as good as the best coastal Bermuda uh, in nutritional value that is heavily fertilized in here. These native grasses, we, they do not see any fertilizer. They're growing naturally. Another management tool we have at our disposal is the use of fire. And so far we've only done test burns. Uh, th this is a test burn plan written by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. UTSA graduate students are doing the research here. Uh, the question we're trying to answer is, what does fire encourage best? The native plants or the invasive plants that we don't want? So once we can answer that question, then we'll know uh, how much uh, fire or whether we can use fire or not as a management tool on this restored prairie. Uh, a uh, test burn looks like something like this. When that fire gets to uh, tall switchgrass, there is a lot of flame. It jumps high in the air and uh, we have to be very, very careful to control it. So the, the way we are controlling these small area test burns, if you can see my cursor, we, we shred very close to the ground around the plot to be burned. And thank God for volunteers because, and, and we typically have around 40 or so volunteers out on these burn days. Volunteers rake the fuel away from here so the fire cannot uh, creep and get into this tall grass beyond where it would quickly get out of control. Uh, now raking is something we could do on a small scale, but we really need the proper equipment to use this management tool on the prairie. And that tool would be a disc harrow that we could pick up with the, with the three point hookup on the tractor and uh, just like volunteer work, uh, we need some. We need assistance to help find the kind of uh, disc harrow we need, or help us buy one. Um, and it, it, it just be a part of the the management process for this prairie. Now, so much for the discussion of restoring a prairie and maintaining it for decades. Uh, we wanted wildlife to recover quickly. So to do that, we went back to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and we applied for a uh, PFW grant, Partners for Fish and Wildlife. And we were awarded a grant. It was a 50% cost sharing where the four of us siblings uh, 
uh, paid up, uh, picked up half the cost and the Fish and Wildlife paid the other half for three projects. There, and we have constructed three wildlife guzzlers, three burrowing owl roost sites, a green tea tree pollinator fire break 50, uh, 50 foot wide, and 10 diversity plots. So those were our first projects. <clears throat> uh, fast forwarding to current, after we've had uh, several years of experience with trying to maintain this prairie, we've learned just as we heard Robert and Melissa Creech talk about last month, they noticed as we have that along our south fence line where there is brush growing in the fence, that on the leeward side of, of, the, of, of a brush line, we don't have any or many, if any, invasive plants. And the reason for that is a brush line stops or at least impedes wind blown uh, uh, invasive grass seeds. So our current two projects are to construct a, and, and we've already planted these in fact, and I'll get to some detail, basically a 100 foot wide windbreak. So getting back to these first four projects, the US Fish and Wildlife projects, uh, we did all of these like five and six years ago. The, the first one, was an Eagle Scout project to construct three wildlife guzzlers. David Pruitt, an Eagle Scout candidate from Lavernia, uh, it was his project. The Scouts built three guzzlers. Here's one of them. A guzzler involves a catchment, which is basically a roof that collects water on a gutter, delivers it to a 550 gallon storage tank, which delivers water then to the guzzler itself. And what we learned very, very quickly is you build it and they will come. Um, within two years, maybe even in just a year after we got some of these prairie plants growing, certainly immediately after we had guzzlers and water for the wildlife, quail were back and quail were everywhere. Um, all kind of birds, uh, reptiles, mammals, uh, use these guzzlers. Uh, we put up game cameras and I really, have not shown these pictures publicly because I guess we don't want folks to know just how beautiful the deer are that have come back and how healthy they are. When we were kids, we never saw a deer on this place. Uh, today we're seeing, we're seeing deer like that. We're seeing bobcats at this particular guzzler. This is the fourth consecutive year where a where we have photographed a family of bobcats. We're not sure how many kittens they have uh, because we can't get all the kittens in a single shot, uh, but what we are aware of one, two, or three, and um, we think one time there were four of them, but we just weren't positive of that. Now this August, well, after a very dry first eight months of the year, at the end of August, we had some very nice rain. And then a week or so later, a very heavy rainfall one night in early September, which completely filled our pond, which had been dry for more than two years. And of course the, the ducks came back and along with the ducks came the predators and our game camera caught this very lucky shot, uh, this bobcat. Uh, we don't know the outcome of this because the next frame didn't tell us whether that duck made it or whether this Bobcat had dinner that night. The next uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services project was the construction of three burrowing owl roost sites. This also was an Eagle Scout project. Jesse Fair of the, of, of the Jordanton Troop was the leader of this project. The, the Boy Scouts built three burrowing owl roost sites. Each site has two burrows. Each burrow has two entries. A burrow is a half barrel with two tubes going to it that lead up to the surface, all this surface. All of this is buried. Uh, the entrance looks like this with a brick on it, brick, uh, open brick. The burrowing owls visit these every year, like in October and November, Actually, we think these are migratory owls coming through, but nobody has stayed. 
And we think the reason they're not staying is because other animals are living in these burrows. Uh, animals that within 24 hours of us opening this entrance up, they fill it back up with dirt. Uh, possums, skunks, uh, rats, mice, ground squirrels, all kinds of animals are getting in here. Snakes, a lot of prairie runners love going in and out of here. So, so these burrows uh, are not serving the intended purpose, but there's other animals living there. And we know that, and so do the bobcats. That same entrance that I just showed you with the deer standing beside it, uh, a bobcat one night was reaching in there trying to get something out. So these are the kind of things we see uh, with some of these wildlife restoration projects. Now, because those burrowing owl sites are not achieving their intended purpose, uh, in September of this year, we, we put in a, a different design in, in two locations. Uh, this is an eight inch, um, about 20 foot long irrigation pipe, uh, thanks to a donation from Julia and Patricia Bird. And what we did with these pipes, we built a fixture on each end of these. Uh, it's a four and a half inch diameter hole, which is the right hole for burrowing owls. Uh, but owl, but uh, coyotes and bobcats can, and foxes cannot get in and I put a little hook, uh, roof on it. And with, with, in a little over a week, we noticed on one of these, a burrowing owl has taken residence. Now we just put a camera there. Uh, but haven't checked it yet. So we, we do not yet have pictures of burrowing owl at either one of these sites yet. Now the third of the PFW projects was uh, to plant a 50 foot wide green tree fire break around uh, Prairie headquarters uh, to, uh, to prevent fire from getting to the buildings. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services designed the uh, fire break, recommended the pollinators. It was a long list of pollinators that could have worked. And we provided that list to l, &L growers. This is a grower down in the valley that grows these kind of uh, native plants. And he produced 2,300 seedlings for us of 15 different varieties. Uh, on planting day in October of 2012, we had 91 volunteers from Wilson and surrounding county Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and 4-H clubs planted all of these seedlings. Uh, three years later, we had a 74% uh, survival rate. Uh, planting day looked like this. They, uh, the the, the uh, seedlings arrived the day before. We, we got them prepared for planting. The volunteers came out on a Saturday and a Sunday, planted all these seedlings. And now eight years later, this is what that fire break looks like. Now this picture, and this picture was taken last week. It tells us a lot. If you look over here on the right-hand side, here's the prairie. This has been grazed by our buffalo herd uh, and that was taken off about a week and a half ago. So the grasses have been eaten down and uh, one of the things to notice here is this cow trail. Cattle often walk in single file. So they make these trails that crisscross the prairie. And what's so important about this, is what the buffalo did, is it makes pathways for small animals, especially quail. We'll see quail running along these, and if a hawk uh, threatens them from the air, all they've got to do is run out into the grass or run out into these bushes for, for protection. Another thing to look at under, underneath these bushes, the intended purpose for the fire break is, is being implemented. You don't see, you see very little, if any, grass growing. So what these, this fire break does is it shades the ground so that there's no fuel here. So when this prairie catches on fire, there's not enough fuel under these bushes to carry the fuel across it and, and into the the headquarters buildings. To me, the most exciting uh, result or outcome of this variety of, of uh, pollinators is the wildlife it supports. This is loaded with birds. They now nest in here. Um, all kinds of uh, butterflies when these plants are blooming and moths and bees and spiders and, and there's 
snakes get in here and rabbits, but it, it's just interesting to come in here and sit still for a while and see what's living in a, in a plant variety like this. Then our last of the PFW projects was to construct 10 diversity plots, five with deer exclusion fencing and five without. We built three nursery tables where we could plant seeds, grow them in trays, and then transplant them to the diversity plots. Here were, were our uh, tables where we grew the plants, planted them in these diversity plots. Where they grew, made seed. The seed then blows out on the prairie to uh, seed it with uh, native wildflowers. Now, fast forwarding to today, after we see so much invasion of invasive grasses, we're now engaged in a project that has planted a 100 foot wide windbreak, 1600 feet long along our south fence. This is partially funded by a grass land restoration incentive program grant. These 100, 100 foot wide break is an outer barrier, 50 feet wide of poly, of uh, woody pollinators, just like the fire break we, we, we looked at around headquarters. Again, it was divine, designed by US Fish and Wildlife Services. We purchased a similar number of pollinators. This year, however, the grower is now producing uh, for 23 species rather than the 15 we got eight years ago. Uh, we, we planted this barrier April 3rd of this year, so it's only two months old. We had, it was a 4-H club event. We had about 40 or 50 4-H club members, uh, about uh, 10 or 15 Alamo area master naturalists and other volunteers like some landowners in the area who are interested in doing the same thing. And, uh, and we planted all these seedlings. The inner barrier is an additional 50 feet of tall grasses. Now we started this effort two years ago uh, in the fall of 2018, where we prepared the soil, like I described earlier, we stirred the soil every time it rained to deplete the 50 foot wide strip of its uh, invasive grasses. And then in September of last year, we seeded it. Now we're sitting in December of 2000, uh, I mean, 2020, and uh, we have a very, very encouraging uh, stand of tall grasses, switchgrass, flower, flower, trichloris, uh, some big blue stem, some Indian grass. And now that we, we had some good rain in August and September, and we had another two inches a few days ago, these grasses are going to really look good and begin serving the purpose of a barrier probably by the end of next year. A couple of slides here to show you how we plant these seedlings. <coughs> We use a subsoiler to plant, uh, to plow trenches uh, 22 inches deep. On uh, planting day, when the seedlings arrive, we have to randomize them so that when they're planted, these 23 species are planted randomly. Uh, when the uh, in, uh, volunteers arrive, uh, all these plants go into the ground. The fact that we've made these 22 inch deep furrows enables the seedlings penetrate with a tap root very quickly and survive a drought, which we know we're gonna have in the next several years before they can become eight or 10 feet tall. And we really hope our volunteers will come back every year and take a look at how their, their seedlings are growing. <clears throat> now this is a lot of work and a lot of investment from uh, volunteers, from, from our family, from agencies, so we wanna preserve all of this in perpetuity. We want it to be sustainable in perpetuity. To do that, we, we place this property under a conservation easement with Native Prairies Association of Texas in uh, 2013. And we're engaging the next generation of caretakers, which includes the San Antonio chapter of IMPACT uh, and other organizations in the area these organizations help us, help us set up workshops. We can, we've been conducting two a year. This year we had none because of the pandemic. We had one scheduled for this coming Friday, the, uh, I mean Saturday, 
the, uh, the Bear Audubon Society was planning to conduct a, a bird, all day bird workshop, um, which we were really looking forward to, but we had to cancel that. We do conduct a work day, the third Saturday of every month where uh, people come out to volunteer. I go out there two or three times a week and volunteers have been joining me on, on some weekends, sometime during the week and to get just some very interesting things done and also just to sit around sometime and, and smell the roses. We are conducting tours with other uh, property owners who want to do the same thing. And one of our family's goal is to leave this prairie in a financially self-sustaining situation. That is the revenue it generates from a leasing to cattle herd, herds and uh, harvesting hay pays for the bills, but it only can pay for the bills. The, the significant projects need uh, community contributions in the way of volunteers and sometimes financing to buy the equipment we need or the, to pay for the special projects. A couple more quick slides. This one here is a workshop. We had about 40 people at it where NRCS presented a workshop on quail. Uh, this, we had similar attendance at this workshop by in Native Prairies Association of Texas on the process of restoring a prairie. Um, one of the most interesting sentences I, or comments I heard was from Chris Best when he said, this res restoration business takes a lot of patience and you have to be willing to keep trying even after multiple failures. And that has certainly been our experience, uh, but it's been fun and it's really a lot of fun when one of the, when some of the residents of that prairie uh, sit still and allow, uh, yeah, allow you to take their, their portrait, their photograph. Or like just this morning, I was on the prairie. It was incredible. Uh, we, there was lots of moisture around because of the rain, had well below freezing temperatures. And this kind of, these crystals grew to form frost. Beautiful every year, I, probably the biggest frost crystals I've ever seen. I gotta admit, this is cow manure, actually buffalo patty. Um, with uh, crystals growing on it. So in closing, let me just throw out a couple of other thoughts. Remember today is Giving Tuesday, so if you're capable and willing, contribute to your favorite prairie or prairie organization. And the San Antonio uh, chapter of the Native Prairies Association of Texas needs officers for 2021, so uh, be thinking about that. Uh, we'll probably do, be doing some discussions on that. So with that, Julia, let me close and turn it over back to you for questions and further discussions. All right, hi everybody. I'm gonna unmute everybody, okay? So just give me a moment. Uh, whoever has questions. Mute. There you go. You don't have to share a video if you don't want to. There we go. Make sure I got every day. Make sure I got everybody here. Okay. Hi, I'd like to say hello to my brother Don. Hello, Susan. I see you. <laughs> we are so happy to see you. Hi. Oh my God. That, that's you know, Susan. We haven't seen them in years because we're up here in Seattle but oh yeah. we have been so following every moment of this uh, restoration of, our, of the farm that we all lived on thank you Don <laughs> well, thank everybody uh, yes um, just okay new options all right, Don, I think you can turn off the screen share if you want okay. to. It's something I can do? Yeah, I believe okay. so. Oh, I, I see, I think. Okay. Ah. All I right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like, let's see if we've got any questions here. So, um, Sean Davis had asked, what kind of container did you use to start the seed? Okay, there were two kinds of containers. 
uh, the kind that was in the photograph were, I think those were Heiko sleeves. Those are paper sleeves. Those are the most difficult to plant in, but they're, to plant seed in, but they are the easiest to transplant to, um, to the, the field. And uh, there were, and, and there's another kind that we used where the sleeve does not come out. It's a plastic tray that could be either eight inches deep, which is what we use for woody plants, or four inches deep, which is what we use for wildflowers and grasses. And the, the, the terms to write down are hyco trays. Those are the plastic ones. And I believe those that are the paper sleeves are Monarch, the manufacturer's Monarch. Now, if, if anybody wants more information on that, send me an email and I will find the, the uh, 